Hello, my babies. I was weird. Uh, Ottawa home sales in May were kind of mid, as the kids say, but is it possible that we're just about to launch? Also, a big surprise in the condo market this month and should Ontario's new mandatory cooling off period for new home purchases also apply to resale homes? We tackle all this and more in your June 2024 Ottawa real estate market update. Here we go. So you know how we do things around here. We're going to start the market update by talking about what happened with freehold and condo sales in Ottawa last month. And then we're going to talk about a recent news item. Basically, we're going to tell some stories, crack some jokes, and uh, we're all going to become even greater friends in the process. All right, so without further ado, let's jump into it. We're going to put the May 2024 freehold sales stats up on the screen in three, two, one. All right, quick reminder, freehold homes are homes without condo fees. We'll talk about condos a little later, but when it comes to freehold, we ended up selling a total of 1,329 homes in Ottawa this May. Uh, that number represents a small increase from April, month that comes before May, uh, where we sold 1,279 homes, but uh, this year's May total is actually about 11% lower than last year's May total, where we saw 1,472 sales occur. Uh, now, in 2023, May was our peak month and by a fair margin. Uh, everyone also thinks that 2023 is having been this brutally slow year for sales in Ottawa. And on the whole, it definitely was. But uh, our three month spring market window last year was actually pretty healthy. Uh, that all being said, before COVID and all that, in recent years, a typical May would see us selling anywhere between 1,600 and 1,800 homes. Uh, and this year's total is obviously well below that. Hashtag math. And so I suspect uh, that there are a couple of factors at play here. First, the obvious, due to affordability challenges we're all facing, I do think that these lower sales totals are just gonna kind of be the new normal, uh, at least for now. Uh, the other factor, and I mentioned this before, is that the highest sales volume month for any given year pretty much always falls in one of April, May, or June. And that does tend to vary somewhat randomly from year to year. Last year it was May by a mile, this year, I think it'll very likely be June by a jump, jolt. June by a juniper, I don't know. Anyways, the reason I think that is because there's going to be a very important Bank of Canada rate announcement in June. Uh, in fact, we're filming this on June 4th. Rate announcement's happening tomorrow, June 5th. It happens to be my brother's birthday. Happy birthday, Gab. First of all, uh, the rate announcement only impacts variable rates. And even if they do come down, they'll still be way higher than fixed rates are right now. So you're, you're probably still gonna be better off going with a fixed rate in most cases anyways. Uh, and also, if you and a bunch of other buyers sit around waiting for rates to come down, and then once that happens, you all jump off the fence and into the market at the same time, it just causes competition to increase, which causes prices to go up. Uh, ultimately, that doesn't help any of you with affordability. Uh, uh, but here's the thing, uh, and I totally get it, uh, it's human nature. Most people will always just feel much more compelled to buy in a hot rising market. Uh, the FOMO kicks in and there's just, there's just something about buying when things are moving up that feels better, even though it often makes a lot more logical sense to buy in a softer market. So, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, and of course, trying to time the market always has been and always will be a fool's errand. Getting it right just has a lot more to do with luck than skills. So my advice, as always, just buy when you're ready. All right, prices. Uh, the average sale price for a freehold home, freehold home in May was about 749K. Uh, that was down a bit from April where we hit a whopping 762K average price, uh, which I will remind you was the highest average ever outside of our six month peak in 2022. Uh, so I call this month's average a sort of like regression to the means, if you will. 749k it's also just a hair higher than last may's average where uh, we were at 746k all right moving on let's talk about inventory as always friendly reminder inventory it's a neat little measure that accounts for both supply and demand all in one uh, now inventory actually went up in may first time that's happened uh, in a while we started the month with 2.3 months of total freehold inventory. We ended with 2.6 months. Uh, now, 2.6 months, still a relatively low total. Uh, that is a general indicator of a seller's market, but uh, seeing inventory go up 
also means that at least for the month of May, there was more supply that came to market than there was demand for it, all right? Now, it's not unusual in a typical year to see inventory levels kind of bottom out in the spring and then start to tick back up, eventually kind of level off as we move into summer, fall, and winter, right? or as I like to call it, Satan's favorite season. Uh, that being said, I do admit that I was a bit surprised to see inventory tick up and by a reasonable amount this soon in the year. I do think, however, that what I said earlier about the, the you know, the, the, there potentially being a lot of people who are waiting on the rate announcement before deciding whether or not to jump into the market could be having an impact on inventory. Um, I'll be very interested to see what happens with sales volume, inventory and pricing in June. I think June's gonna be a very informative month that should give us a pretty good indication as to whether we're going to have a sort of like steady second half of the year or maybe something a little stronger. All right, uh, wrapping up the freehold sales stats here, homes that sold in May took an average of 27 days to sell. That was down from 28 last month and they sold for 98.8% of their list price, which is no change from the past two months. Um, now. 98.8% sale price to list price ratio is an interesting one to me. What it tells me, uh, and it's also something I can personally attest to with my own clients, is that buyers right now aren't necessarily looking for smoking deals. They're really prioritizing quality and value, right? So think about this. We had a month where sales volume was kind of sluggish and where there were more new sellers that came to market than there were buyers, right? And yet, the average selling price was still very strong and all of the homes that did sell on average went for damn near full price, right? 98.8% of the asking price. So that tells us that buyers are being picky and if you're a seller, it really speaks to the importance of pricing your home right, right? So slapping a, a super high asking price on a home and then just kind of like expecting to negotiate down once you find a buyer, it just doesn't work in a market like this one. Most buyers, they won't even go see your house, much less come to the negotiating table if they don't feel like your home offers good or at least fair value, right? And of course, your asking price is obviously gonna play a huge role in how buyers perceive the value of your home, right? As you all know, uh, I like analogies. And so I'm gonna give you a quick and fun little analogy that I think illustrates what I'm, what I'm trying to say here, so try, try and stay with me. Let's say I told you, right, I told you that I was gonna take you to dinner tonight and that I was gonna let you choose from one of three options. So option one, we go to a nearby gas station, get a couple of hot dogs and eat them in the parking lot behind the bathrooms. Right? Option two, we go to the Burger King in the bad part of town. And then option three, we go to the Royal Oak. All right. now, Safe to say the Royal Oak's never gonna win a Michelin star, but I think that the large majority of people would be very happy to choose it in the scenario I just described. In fact, they'd probably be fucking thrilled after hearing the first two options, right? Now, let's say that instead of those three options, I gave you the following. So, option one, okay, still the Royal Oak. Option two is Harmon's, right? Best steakhouse in Ottawa. And option three, is supply and demand. One of the top 100 restaurants in all of Canada and in my humble opinion, the best restaurant in the city. Well, all of a sudden, the Royal Oak probably doesn't look so hot anymore, right? The, the point of this little analogy is, this to, is just to show how a product's perceived appeal is always gonna be greatly impacted by the other options available or the, the competition, right? And so when it comes to selling your home, it's super important to keep in mind that when you choose your list price, you're also choosing your competition. So that'll do it for the freehold portion of this month's update. Uh, we had a pretty exciting development in condos in May that I can't wait to tell you about. But before we talk about that, just wanna take a moment to thank this month's fake market update sponsor. This month's market update is brought to you by Pogo Ball Blasters. Pogo Ball Blasters, if you know what I'm talking about, you're getting old. We're gonna put those May 2024 condo sales stats up on the screen now. All right, so in May, we sold a total of 423 condos in Ottawa. Uh, that's up a fair bit from the 382 units we sold in the previous month. Uh, that would be April, the month that comes before May. But 
Uh, it is about 10% less than the 467 condos we sold in May of last year. All right, so similar trend in freehold. Uh, fairly recent history would tell us that in a typical year, we'd normally see somewhere between like 450 and 600 condo sales uh, in the month of May. So this year's total is definitely on the low side of things, you know, relatively speaking. Also, much like it did for freehold, condo inventory went up uh, for the first time in a while in May. We started the month off with 2.2 months of inventory, ended it with 2.4 months. And once again, 2.4 months of inventory, still considered to be a pretty low total, uh, but seeing an uptick there tells us that for the month, there was more condo supply that came to market than there was condo demand, okay? Uh, I, once again, same deal here as for freehold. I think that the anticipation around the Bank of Canada's June rate announcement could have pushed some would-be buyers to take a wait and see approach in May, uh, which could explain at least in part what we saw happen with sales volume and inventory. Now, uh, here's where things got really interesting for condos in May. Uh, now, if you've been following these updates, you already know okay, that the average sale price for condos in Ottawa has fallen somewhere between about $410,000 and $450,000, technically $453,000, every single month for a very, very, very long time. Okay, we've literally been stuck in that range for about two full years now, okay? Until now. That's right, it finally happened. Hey, we broke out of that 410 to 450K range and we ended May with an average condo sale price of about $462,000, okay? Now, in case you're wondering, that is the fifth highest monthly average sale price we've ever seen for condos in Ottawa. It was only surpassed by the four month peak of 2022, which took place between Feb and May of that year, right? So kind of a big deal, right? But also kind of odd, right? Like if you had told me at the start of May that condo sales would lag behind last year and that we'd have more condo supply uh, come to market than we had condo demand for the month, I certainly would not have predicted that we'd be setting a new two-year high for the average sale price. Right, it's a little weird. So uh, that really got me thinking about what could be happening with the condo market dynamics right now and, and how that could potentially explain what we just saw in the month of May. And so uh, I ended up coming up with two possible explanations or, or theories uh, that I'd like to share with you if you'll humor me. Theory number one is that it's just random variance. Right, which let's face it, could, could very well be the case. We're dealing with a one month sample size uh, and it wouldn't surprise me one bit uh, to see us back in that familiar sort of 410 to 450K channel uh, next month, right? Uh, but that theory is boring, right? And a, and a 30 minute long YouTube video about auto real estate should never be boring. Allow me to regale you, my baby is still weird, with theory number two. All right, so hear me out. If we take an overview of the condo, of, of all condo buyers, right? We can basically slot each of them into one of three categories, right? First, you have investors, right? Now, now condo investors largely tend to prioritize centrally located smaller units, bachelors and one bedroom units, right? They like those units to be in these kind of newer, but sort of mid range buildings, right? So it's like, I'm basically they, they want units that have low fees and that are easy to rent. Right? Condo investors are not the ones who are typically going to be buying up your penthouses and your large luxury units and these kind of super high-end amenity rich buildings. Okay? So that's the first group. Second, you have the people who are buying a condo for what we're going to call affordability reasons. Right? These are often first time buyers uh, or, or they're buyers who just can't quite afford a freehold home in their desired location. And so they go for a condo instead. Right, so uh, a lot of these buyers, or for a lot of these buyers, the condo is, is really used as a stepping stone towards the eventual purchase of a freehold home. And obviously, given that their motivation is affordability, uh, these buyers also aren't the people who are buying up the, the, the larger, really expensive units. Okay? And that leads us to our third and final group. And, and those are the people who are choosing a condo for what we're gonna call lifestyle reasons. These are usually downsizers they're, they're people, or, or they're people who just really want that low maintenance lifestyle in an A-plus location. 
Uh, sometimes they're people who spend a lot of time traveling or who have multiple homes in different places around the world. Uh, and so affordability or return on investment is typically not the main priority here, right? Again, it, it's really all about lifestyle for this group. And so um, these are the people who are the most likely to be buying the larger units, the more expensive units and high-end buildings with tons of amenities, right? Okay, so now that I've, I've laid that out for you, let's look at what's happened with each of these three groups in recent months. Okay, we'll start with condo investors, all right? So condo investors, they gone, right? Like. The numbers on a condo purchase make absolutely no sense for an investor right now. Uh, there's a ton of new competition from renters for all of these new, you know, purpose-built luxury rental buildings. And uh, with purchase prices, interest rates, and condo fees being where they are, even if you got a good deal on a good unit, you're still pretty much guaranteed to run deep in the red every single month, probably for a very long time. All right, so, so that segment of condo buyers has basically just ex exited the market. Investors are looking for different opportunities elsewhere. Okay, so next, let's talk about group two. All right, and these are the people uh, that are buying for affordability reasons. See, the funny thing about affordability is that for it to work, it actually has to be fucking affordable, right? Uh, so for the same reason we just mentioned, interest rates, condo fees, etc. In a best case scenario right now, the monthly costs associated with buying and owning a condo would be about 50% higher, if not more, than just renting out that very same unit, right? So you can rent it for 2,000 or, or you can own it for 3,000 plus per month, right? And so a lot of the people that were once using condo purchases as a stepping stone towards a freehold home are now looking around and they're thinking, you know what, Like maybe it just makes more sense to rent and save right now rather than buy the condo. All right, so a lot of those buyers have also been taken off the board. And that leaves us with the third group, right? Who choose condos for lifestyle reasons. And you know, by and large, they're still buying because unlike the other two groups, lifestyle condo buyers, they're not primarily buying the units as stepping stones or investments. And so they're not really focused on ROI and appreciation, uh, or at least they're not as focused on ROI and appreciation as the other two groups. They're buying condos because that's just a product that makes the most sense for them and they have the means to do so. Uh, and again, this is the group that tends to buy the larger, higher priced units, right? So I think that could explain some of what we're seeing with condos as of late, that the buyers who are leaving the market are primarily those who were snapping up the smaller, more affordable units. And so now we're seeing a higher percentage of condo sales occur in that luxury segment, which obviously will have an impact on the average sale price, right? Again, very possible that I just did this whole spiel for nothing and that this is just a blip. But uh, if this little theory of mine proves to be true, I think that big picture, we could continue to see strong monthly average sale prices for condos, even if sales volume and inventory levels don't quite follow suit. All right, time will tell, right? Uh, I guess you'll just have to keep watching these updates to, to find out whether you get to call me a, a genius or a moron in the comments. I personally like to think of myself as something of an idiot savant, so nice little middle ground there. Uh, anyways, wrapping up condos. Uh, condos that sold in May on average went for 98.7% of the list price and they took an average of 30 days to sell. Again, big picture view here. Uh, buyers for, for both condos and freehold properties, they're being picky, but they are very much willing to pay for quality and value. So that's the name of the game right now. All right. That'll do it for the stats. Ladies and gentlemen, hope you had fun because I know I did. And, uh, and hey, we're not done yet, all right? Let's talk about some recent news, shall we? And, uh, and to change things up, we're actually going to lay off the, the liberals and their whole housing clown show this month. Instead, I'm going to tell you about Ontario's new 10-day cooling off period for new construction homes. So uh, you may have read about this, uh, but for those who are unaware, as of about a week ago, anyone in Ontario who buys a new construction freehold home, right? So you're buying from the builder, you now benefit from a mandatory 10 day cooling off period, okay? So what that means is that now, after you've signed your purchase agreement for a new construction home, you're going to have 10 days where you can basically just change your mind for any reason and, and just cancel the purchase and walk away without penalty. Okay. These 10 day cooling off periods were already in place for new construction condos, but as far, and as, and as, far as I'm concerned, extending them to freehold homes uh, was long overdue. All right now, I know some people are going to ask, 
well, why wouldn't we just have mandatory cooling off periods for all purchases, right? New builds and resale. And I will dive into resale in a moment, but first, it's important to note that the process for buying directly from a builder has some, some very key differences when compared to buying a resale home from another individual, All right, So very, very different types of contracts. When you buy new construction, you're usually having to sign a very lengthy contract that was drafted by the builder's lawyer, right? These contracts are usually fairly hard to understand. They contain a lot of technical legal jargon uh, and their sole purpose really is to protect the builder and to give that builder the maximum amount of flexibility allowable by law, which happens to be quite a bit of flexibility, by the way, okay? Um, so I certainly wouldn't call these contracts, you know, collaborative or, or balanced, right? They're, they're heavily skewed in favor of the builder and uh, their, their key terms are typically damn near non-negotiable, if not completely so. Okay, so uh, just to give you an idea, here are some of the examples of terms you'd almost certainly have to agree to in order to buy a pre-construction home. Okay, so first, the builder has the unilateral right to delay your possession date by close to a year, sometimes even longer, right? So you thought you were moving in in May, but you may end up having to move in in January, right? Satan's season, right? Oh, and, and if interest rates happen to go up during that delay and, and you end up no longer being able to afford to close on the home as a result, it's just too bad for you, right? The builder gets to keep your deposit, which is usually 10 to 20% of the purchase price. And they can also sue you for additional damages, even though it was their delay that essentially caused the situation, All right? Pre-construction contract also usually allows a builder to make certain changes to, to the home or to your home without your consent. Uh, if the builder's costs end up being higher than anticipated, in many cases, they're allowed to just pass those extra costs on to you. Um, and also, if a project starts to look like it won't be profitable or, or profitable enough, uh, the builder can just cancel it. Meaning that at any point after you've signed your contract, the builder could just literally decide not to build your house anymore and then just walk away without penalty, right? And, and those are just a few examples, okay? So, and then, in addition to these very one-sided contracts, you you also have some, okay, not all, not all, but some builder reps who will definitely employ what I would call high pressure sales tactics, right? Like I've, I've been to some of these sales centers where it just seems like the home you're interested in is always the last one left. Uh, there's always all these other buyers who are also interested in the home and also like, hey, the, the price is, is, is going up any day now, right? Every single time. Right. And again, just to be crystal clear, that doesn't characterize all builders or builder sales reps. There's a lot of them that are, are quite frankly, amazing to deal with, like EQ Homes, Modbox and a bunch of others. But nonetheless, uh, we see a lot of these situations where, you know, a person who's like really just curious walks into a sales center on a whim one day and then, and then the, you know, 30 minutes later, 30 minutes later, they end up leaving. Uh, with their head spinning, having just signed off on a contract that I can all but guarantee they don't totally understand uh, or have even fully read for the biggest purchase that they've ever made in their life, right? And so, yeah, I think the 10-day cooling off period for new construction purchases was long overdue. I think it's, it's very much needed, okay? At least now, when you buy new construction, a buyer can take the time to have a lawyer review their purchase contract. They can make sure that everything is fully understood, including the risks. They can talk to their lender, do their research, and just really think about things uh, before firmly committing to such a massive purchase uh, under some pretty strict terms, right? Let's face it. All right, so now the question of why we wouldn't just have this the same 10 day cooling off period for all purchases of homes, new construction and resale. But keep in mind, that the purpose of a policy like the 10 day cooling off period is, is to protect consumers, okay? So uh, when it comes to new construction sales, you have a consumer that is buying from a corporation, right? A corporate entity, and usually a pretty large one at that. Whereas when it comes to resale, both sides of the transactions are consumers, right? Buyer and seller. Um, and, and just so you know, they actually did implement a mandatory cooling off period for resale homes in BC last year. It was a three day cooling off period, not a 10 day. Um, but again, so in BC, when you buy a home, any home resale, you have a mandatory three day cooling off period. 
And from what I've been told and from what I've read, it's caused a lot more problems than it's solved when it comes to resale. Uh, it opens a door for a lot of bad faith negotiation on the part of on the part of buyers, which can harm sellers who, once again, also consumers, right? So the other thing to keep in mind is that the standard agreement of purchase and sale uh, for a resale home in Ontario is actually designed to be pretty even, right? It's, it's supposed to be basically, it's supposed to basically provide an equal amount of protection for a buyer and a seller. Um, and maybe most importantly of all, the terms of resale agreements here are 100% negotiable, right? So a buyer could actually include a 10 day cooling off period in their offer if they wanted to, uh, along with anything else they feel is important. Like you could, you could literally ask for the seller's family dog in your offer if you wanted to. It's all negotiable, right? You'd be a dick if you did that though. Uh, now, having said all that, uh, the best thing you can do to protect yourself as a buyer or a seller and to ensure a great outcome in any transaction, obviously, just work with a great agent. You wanna find someone who knows their stuff, who's thorough, who is going to really take the time to understand your wants, your needs, your goals, and then guide you through the buying or selling process in a way that's comfortable and ensures you get a great result, okay? Right. Oh, and also, ideally, their name should probably rhyme with Purge Sapino. Don't ask me why, it's just really important. All right, and uh, if you're looking for someone like that, you might know a guy, you can reach him uh, at the contact info right here, we'll set up a time for an initial discovery call, and uh, yeah, that'll do it for this month. As always, thanks for watching. I'm Serge Papineau. Oh, that rhymes with, that rhymes with Purge Sapino. Anyways, I, uh, I look forward to catching up with you next month. Until then, I'm gonna go sell some homes. See you then.